We're going to talk about total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. Uh, the purpose of total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy, uh, otherwise known as TERF, uh, is to selectively illuminate fluorophores that are right near a surface uh, and not illuminate fluorophores that are further into the solution above the surface. Um, the main reason for doing that is uh, in two applications. One is uh, in single molecule studies where you want to see the molecules right on the surface but you don't want to see a lot of background fluorescence. And the other main use is to look at living cells in culture where uh, you might be interested in the cell substrate contact region and any organelles that are near there, but you don't want to see the fluorescence from further in the cell. Uh, so in both cases, there's a big background fluorescence reduction, and that's the main purpose of TERF. There are other purposes too, which I will get to. Uh, but first I'll give some examples. Uh, then uh, after the examples, we'll talk about the fundamental principles of TERF, uh, how to set it up, uh, what limitations there are, uh, and other useful features other than background reduction. And then there's a, an important question about what does an objective, particularly a high aperture objective in a microscope, actually see of the fluorescence that's excited. And then uh, the last topic will be uh, looking at uh, polarization of the uh, uh, field that's produced by turf because uh, it allows you to study orientations of fluorophores. So we'll start with the examples. Um, this series of pictures uh, is of cells, uh, in this case uh, cells that are designed to secrete uh, little packets of chemicals. Um, and these packets uh, in this uh, particular sample are labeled with uh, GFP, so you can see where the packets are. The packets are called granules. These are chromaffin cells. Um, those granules, though, are all through the depth of the cell. So on the bottom uh, here, if you look at uh, the pictures on the two lower parts, uh, that is regular illumination of this uh, kind of preparation. Regular illumination uh, is called epi, epi illumination. Uh, and the problem there is that it's very fuzzy. Uh, you see a lot of out of focus fluorescence uh, and it's hard to resolve an individual granule because of the low contrast with uh, the large background. With turf, you can see more clearly the individual granules and uh, it's because only the granules that are right near the surface are showing up in the picture. Here's another example. Uh, the bottom again is uh, epi illumination and these are cells that are labeled with dye I which completely labels the plasma membrane on the bottom, on the top and even some membranes inside. And so in epi, you don't see that much detail. Uh, you just see where the cells are, and it's very bright and a nice uh, edge to it. But uh, with TIR uh, toward the top, uh, you only see the cell substrate contact regions. Here we're going to talk about the principles uh, that uh, turf microscopy works upon. Uh, what's necessary is to illuminate the sample with a beam at a very oblique angle. And the beam could either be a laser or a conventional source, but usually a laser. Uh, the beam is coming in here, coming up through the glass to a glass water interface. And then if the angle of incidence, this angle theta, is big enough, it will totally internally reflect. All the light will reflect back from the interface. Uh, at that angle and larger angles, you don't get light propagating out into the water, but you do get 
a field right above the surface in the water that's exponentially decaying as you go away from the surface in what we call the Z direction. And the depth of that decay is very small. It can be as small as one-fifth or one-tenth of the wavelength of light, depending on how big the incidence angle theta is. So what you can see here is that if there's a fluorescent molecule, say, out here somewhere, it won't be in that field. If it's closer, it will be in the field, but in a dimmer part, and it'll light up a little bit. Uh, and if it's really close to the surface, it will get excited easily and be quite bright. Uh, so uh, this field uh, is called the evanescent field. Uh, evanescent means uh, disappearing. And it's not disappearing in time. It's always there. It's just disappearing in space as you go up in the z direction, a fraction of a wavelength. So how do you set this up in a microscope? Uh, there's various ways. There's two main types of ways. One is with a prism uh, that you uh, uh, buy ec uh, and install externally. Uh, and the other is using the microscope objective itself. So first we'll talk about the prism-based method. Uh, one way is in an upright microscope, it's very simple, uh, just put a, something like a trapezoidal prism on the condenser mount of the microscope. And then the beam comes in through the lower part of the microscope, reflects up through the base, and uh, totally internally reflects at the uh, upper surface of that trapezoid, uh, which is in optical contact with the bottom of a glass bottom uh, uh, tissue culture dish where the sample is. And from the top, you look at uh, the sample with uh, an air or water immersion objective. Uh, you could do something very similar to this, except instead of a prism, uh, you just use a high aperture condenser. In fact, this system is commercially available. Uh, if you use an inverted microscope in the prism-based system, uh, you, the objective is below and the prism is above and there's various types of prisms you could use. Uh, you could even have a, a, a system where uh, it's a prism-based one in an inverted scope, but the sample is completely accessible by coming in from the bottom, going through a prism, and then bouncing back and forth and back and forth, uh, and totally internally reflecting right over the optical axis of the objective and there's still plenty of access for micro pipettes or changes of solution. But the, actually the most popular way of doing turf uh, nowadays is objective-based turf, where you don't need an external prism at all. Uh, but you do need a very high aperture objective. The idea here is as follows. Uh, there is a plane uh, in back of the objective, someplace actually in the, in the objective unit itself, called the back focal plane. If the laser beam passes through that back focal plane off axis, in other words, not coming right down the middle, but instead coming uh, off to the side, then when it gets up to the objective, it will emerge from the objective at a steep angle. And if the objective's width or diameter or aperture is big enough, then uh, that angle will be above the critical angle for total internal reflection. And uh, then you just look through a, a cover slip or a glass-bottomed uh, uh, tissue culture dish, and you'll get total internal reflection. And the same objective is used for gathering the fluorescence that's emitted. Um, the requirement here is not just that you're passing the beam off axis, so you get the angle, but also that the beam is focused at the back focal plane, because 
if it's focused there, then the light that emerges from the objective will come out collimated. In other words, all the rays will be parallel and all going at the same angle. And you want them all at the same angle because you want them all to be totally internally reflecting. So there's two requirements. Uh, focus off axis far enough with a high aperture objective and make sure that it is focused at the back focal plane. So this can be done by a variety of methods. You can uh, use uh, what some microscopes have as a side port uh, where you come in uh, to the turret that mounts the objectives from the side and just have a lens over here uh, that you adjust its position and its position uh, back and forth so that you make sure that you're off axis focused at the back focal plane. Uh, there's other methods uh, too. Or you could come in uh, at a uh, port in the microscope that might be marked aperture plane uh, and make sure that the beam is focused there. Uh, and then if it's focused at the aperture plane, well, it turns out that aperture plane and back focal plane are really complementary. So if you're focused at an aperture plane, you're also focused at a back focal plane. Uh, there's other ways of doing this. Uh, if there is no aperture plane port in back of the microscope, uh, just uh, set your own lens up here and make sure that uh, you're focused at the back focal plane. Uh, many commercial setups are like this. And instead of using a laser beam, just an open raw laser beam, uh, you actually focus the tip of a fiber optic bundle uh, with a lens to focus at the back focal plane, and that works quite well too. You don't need to use a laser. Uh, you could use a regular mercury arc. The problem is a mercury arc uh, sends light in all directions uh, in quite a, a width instead of a nice thin pencil of light. So uh, to do turf, you don't want light that's close to the optical axis. You only want light that's far away. So you have to block the light that's close to the optical axis with a opaque disc of some type uh, and only allow peripheral light to get through. Uh, and then uh, you could do uh, turf even with a mercury arc. And there are commercial setups that uh, uh, implement this and they're called uh, white light turf. Uh, not because the whiteness is important but just because a mercury arc is, is white colored. <clears throat> This method of uh, doing turf with an arc source rather than a laser actually works. Um, if you prepare a sample, as you can see up, up here, uh, just a, a glass bottom dish where the glass is labeled with dye eye, uh, just sticks to the glass, doesn't dissolve in water. See, it's a way of labeling a glass surface. And above it, you put uh, a fluorescein solution. So in TIR, you should only see the surface. Uh, the dye eye is orange, fluorescein is green uh, when you excite its fluorescence. So with regular epi, as you can see over here, you see mostly green, because the fluorescein in the water is getting excited, is excited as well as the dye eye on the surface. With TIR, you, uh, even with mercury arc TIR and this opaque block, uh, you see just the fluorophore on the surface, the dye eye. And if you look at something like dye eye labeled red blood cells, in epi, uh, you just see round uh, circles, biconcave discs. Uh, but uh, in TIR, you see uh, just the region where a biconcave disc is touching the glass. So it looks sort of like a, like a ring or a crescent. So which is better, uh, prism-based or objective-based turf? Um, the prism-based method is uh, better in that it has less scattering because there's scattering of the laser light if it had to go through an objective. It's much cheaper. It's hundreds of dollars instead of tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, it works well for low magnification and for water immersion objectives. <clears throat> it's easiest to do with uh, an open, free, laser. And uh, you can access a large range of incidence angles. And you like to do that because 
the bigger the incidence angle, the thinner the evanescent field, and you might want to have control over that. The objective-based method is very good for high magnification, high aperture studies, which actually is quite common in cell biology. It's very stable, no separate optical elements hanging on separate posts. Uh, it's easy to set up, it's commercially available, and it works with either a free collimated laser or an optical fiber input from a laser or conventional arc sources. So what are some of the limitations of uh, turf? I mean, uh, every technique in, uh, in uh, science uh, has some drawbacks. Uh, well, of course, uh, turf is only good for looking at things at surfaces. That, that's uh, clear. Uh, but uh, you also do get a scattering of excitation light in the objective when you use objective-based. Uh, you can get scattering of light um, because of index of refraction discontinuities on the sample. Some places on the sample are denser than others, and that the, the, uh, even the evanescent light uh, uh, gets converted into scattered light uh, at those places. And then the scattered light can continue on and excite more fluorescence, and it makes an impurity. Uh, you don't have a pure, exponentially decaying field anymore. Uh, and also, uh, whenever you're using laser excitation, whether it's turf or not, uh, you can get interference fringes. So we're going to talk about uh, each of these uh, little problems in order. How can you measure how much scattering there is in the objective if you're doing objective-based turf? Uh, one way is to get a bead that has a pretty low index of refraction uh, and coat it with dye I on its surface so it basically looks like a hollow sphere of fluorescence. Uh, then uh, if you have that bead sitting on the surface, uh, then the lower part of it uh, down here will be in the evanescent field and it'll get excited. The deeper the evanescent field is, the further up the side of the sphere you'll get excitation. And then by looking with an objective from the bottom in the microscope, uh, you just look at how wide is the area of illumination from, from here to, to here, and you can get a measure of how deep the evanescent field is. And uh, if that's done, uh, you find out that at uh, as it should be, that at low incidence angles, near the critical angle, the evanescent field is quite broad, and at high, higher incidence angles, it's, uh, it's thinner. Uh, but uh, the problem is it's not exactly exponential. Uh, the blue part of these graphs here shows uh, an exponential contribution to the intensity, but the yellow part at the bottom uh, just depicts the scattering part. Uh, the scattering part doesn't decay as rapidly as the evanescent uh, field that's exponentially decaying does. So you can see when you're looking at a fluorophore that's right close to the surface at what you might call z equals zero, most of the intensity is evanescent, but a little bit, maybe 10% is scattering. But as you get further out, a fluorophore further out from the surface, uh, several wavelengths away, most of it is scattering and not evanescent. So you have to keep that in mind. Then the second limitation has to do with non-homogeneities in the sample itself. Uh, let's say here's a typical cell. Uh, it has organelles in it. Some organelles or some regions might have a lower index of refraction than the average. Some might have a higher index than the average. So here comes the laser beam. Uh, where there's a higher index of refraction, you won't get total internal reflection. The light will just propagate out and bounce around all over the place. And even in the places where you do get total internal reflection, because of the discontinuity of index of refraction, you still get scattering. So you can see that the sample is doing its own scattering. Uh, this is still a, a problem that uh, needs to be resolved uh, theoretically exactly how much scattering do you get. Uh, in practice, it's usually not a serious problem, but it is noticeable, uh, particularly on the uh, more dense cells. So 
Uh, just for example, if you simulate a cell with, say, a glass bead instead of a cell uh, and uh, illuminate with turf, uh, if you use uh, a turf at a lower incidence angle so that the evanescent field is deeper, uh, if these beads are placed in a fluorescein solution, you can see where the scattered light is. And every bead is causing sort of a flare uh, that, that uh, disrupts the evanescent field. At a higher incidence angle where the evanescent field is thinner, the, uh, the disruption isn't as bad. So in general, it's good to go to as high an incidence angle as you can get away with to avoid uh, the disruption due to uh, scattering at uh, non-homogeneities. Uh, one thing that uh, is uh, worth pointing out here is that uh, cells are usually growing on collagen, even uh, collagen that they make themselves rather than collagen that you may or may not have put down. Uh, and that positions the cell further from the substrate, uh, uh, perhaps in a region where scattering is more important than the evanescent field. Uh, so you want to make sure that the collagen layer is not too thick. Uh, otherwise, you'll be looking at scattering light excitation rather than uh, evanescent field excitation. The last problem limitation I wanted to talk about in some detail is uh, just illuminating by a laser uh, gives you interference fringes um, because the laser light is coherent and any defect in the optics, any place, any dust, any warping of any surface scratches, uh, it will make interference fringes on the sample. And the sample itself will produce interference fringes too. Uh, if you look at it, you see uh, a lot of intensity uh, variations that really aren't on the sample, and that's, that's an artifact. Um, if you could come in with the laser light from many directions, from all kinds of different directions, well, all being TIR, but uh, all around various azimuthal angles, then those fringes, those interference fringes, might average out. And in fact, it, it does work. Uh, by putting the right kind of optics, uh, you know, a, a mirrors that uh, make the beam go around in a circle, uh, or spinning wedges, uh, you can uh, spin the azimuthal angle while keeping the, uh, the angle of incidence still the same. And uh, the interference fringes um, seem to disappear. They're really there. They're just changing so fast that the camera and your eye doesn't see them. Now we're getting to other useful features of uh, turf. Um, people often want to know uh, what is the concentration profile of a fluor for near a surface. I mean, it might not just be a single molecule or a very thin layer at a particular position. It might have um, more at uh, one location uh, less at another location, and you would like to discover what is that profile. You can do that by varying the incidence angle, which varies the evanescent field depth. Uh, if you arrange it that you get a pretty deep depth, then uh, the field will be deep enough to excite fluorophores that are pretty far from the surface, as well as fluorophores nearby, and you'll get a certain total fluorescence, whereas if the field was much thinner with a bigger incidence angle, you'll only excite fluorophores right near the surface. And uh, by varying the incidence angle continuously and the depth continuously, uh, you can deduce what the concentration profile was. Uh, also, when you look at turf, uh, the most noticeable thing is that the field seems very flat. You don't see anything out of focus because the places where that would be out of focus aren't even being excited. Uh, so that means that the, either the sample is in focus or it's out of focus. It's not a question of where you're focused. Uh, and uh, it's easy to do uh, the technique called image deconvolution. Uh, where it's a basically a sharpening technique. It's very easy to do with turf because there's only one plane to worry about. There's other features of uh, turf that are interesting for cell biology, uh, particularly 
that uh, normally in cell biology uh, with epi-illumination, uh, the cells don't like to be illuminated. Uh, they tend to die or at least they stop doing what they are normally doing when they're under the light. Um, Turf only illuminates the very bottom of the cell, so the cells are not nearly as sensitive to the fact that they're being illuminated, and they survive under a time-lapse movie for a much longer time, uh, you know, a week instead of just uh, hours. Also, uh, uh, this Turf technique is particularly good for single molecule spectroscopy because often you have molecules on the surface, there's other molecules in the bulk that are fluorescent, and you don't want to see the ones in the bulk. Uh, you need a lot of contrast because the total amount of fluorescence is quite low, so it's good for that. Also, um, if you come in with a turf beam this way, and a uh, turf beam that way on the same sample so that they're intersecting, you get very fine stripes. So the stripes, in fact, are so fine that you can't even see them. They're, they're spaced smaller than the resolution of the microscope. And those stripes are useful uh, in a technique called structured illumination, which actually was invented at UCSF by Mats Gustaf Gustafsson. Uh, and uh, it's a way of illuminating the sample and then shifting the stripes a little bit, taking a picture, shifting them again a little bit, taking a picture, that really enhances the resolution of the image. So it's a super resolution technique and it's, it's very effectively implemented with turf. Okay, now the next question is what do we see, or what does the objective see, uh, from a fluorophore that's near a surface? Uh, this isn't a specifically a TIR or turf question. Any fluorophore that's excited near a surface will have a pretty interesting pattern of em emission. It's not true that uh, fluorophore just emits in all directions. Even an isolated fluorophore with no surface nearby does not emit in all directions. Uh, but when you put a, a surface nearby, the anisotropy of the directions of emission becomes really extreme. Um, so let's say the fluorophore is right there at, at this surface. Uh, it emits a lot of light uh, in a hollow cone along here. And this hollow cone goes all the way around. Uh, depending on the orientation of the dipole of the, of the fluorophore on the surface, um, you get a different pattern. So the pattern of emission depends not only on whether there's a surface nearby, but also on the orientation of the dipole. And uh, this is one a reason for using a high aperture objective, because you can see that much of the light that's emitted from a dipole uh, goes into a very high angle. Uh, and if the objective has a low aperture, you'll miss that. So it's not like, well, uh, 1.45 aperture is a little bit better than 1.3. 1.45 will catch this ring, this hollow cone, whereas 1.3 will entirely miss it. Then. There's something interesting about this, too. Uh, there's this line here. This I show it as a dashed white line. Um, that uh, separates two regions. The region below that, or you know, smaller angles into the glass, uh, is basically light that's just propagating from the fluorophore. The region Above that line is what's uh, coming from what's called the fluorophore near field. That's light that doesn't travel from the fluorophore um, and normally wouldn't be seen. But if the fluorophore is right near a surface, like it would have to be in turf, but any time a fluorophore is near a surface, uh, 
that near field can interact with the glass of the surface and get converted into propagating light in the surface. And then that propagating light can be captured. So it really is nice uh, to have a high aperture objective because it's a way of seeing some of the light from a fluorophore that you otherwise wouldn't see, the light that comes from the fluorophore's near field. Okay, now we're going to talk about polarization of uh, the uh, evanescent field, and it actually turns out to be quite interesting and useful. With regular epi illumination, uh, you can have polarization that's either um, this way or uh, back and forth, uh, you know, in the plane of this screen. Um, and when the epi illumination light comes up through the middle of the objective, it forms uh, uh, a polarization that's either in what we call the x direction or the y direction in the plane of the sample. And the only polarization that you get is in the plane of the sample. Even if it's what you might call unpolarized light, it's not really unpolarized because there is no polarization, no electric field energy in the z direction at all in epi illumination. With turf, though, coming up with the same polarized incident, incident light, but of course coming through the periphery of the objective so you get the big angle of incidence, the polarization turns out to have a large Z component. It's the only way you can get a Z component on a sample is with, is with turf. So you can either get a Z component um, or this uh, Y component uh, here, this Y component. And those two components are the polarizations of the evanescent field. The Z component you can see is in the plane of incidence, you know, the plane of incidence defined by the light coming in and the light reflecting. Uh, so that, that's a plane, that's called a plane of incidence, and Z is in that plane. So since it's polarization parallel to that plane, it's called p-polarized, parallel polarization. Uh, the other polarization, the Y polarization that you could get, depending on the uh, polarization of the incident light, is perpendicular to the plane of incidence. And in German, that would be Senkrecht or uh, S-pole. So we get P-pole and S-pole light. Now what can you do with it? Well, one thing you can do with it is uh, try to label a sample with a fluorophore that's really oriented. Uh, one example is di-I. When di-I labels a membrane, it sits in a membrane uh, as part of the lipid bilayer and orients in there. Uh, its transition dipole moment, which is the preferred direction of its uh, absorption and emission of, uh, of an electric field, uh, is uh, indicated here. And uh, so you get a preferred direction of absorption polarization and emission polarization with di-I. So what does that do for you? Well, let's say you label uh, a membrane with di-I. In the parts of the membrane that are flat on the substrate, the polarization, that well, the orientation of the di-I will be parallel to the surface. In places where there might be an indentation in the membrane, which in a real membrane might be an exocytotic or endocytotic site, for example, or some other kind of uh, um, um, ripple, uh, then those places, the di-I orientation is perpendicular to the surface. Now let's say you excited the whole business with p-polarized evanescent field. Uh, that's the polarization that's along the z-axis as, as it is here. That kind of polarization will not excite dipoles or transition dipole moments in the di-I that are oriented like that because you don't get excitation when the electric field of the exciting light is perpendicular to the molecule. But in places like this where the dipole moment is parallel to the excitation light, both in the z direction, you get a lot of excitation. So with this technique, 
the indentations show up. They get bright, whereas every place else is still dark. So this is a method of seeing indentations in, uh, in a cell membrane that otherwise with regular epi-illumination can't be seen because you can't get a Z polarization, uh, a Z direction polarization from an epi-illumination. So let's say you take a picture with P polarized incident light and take a picture with S polarized incident light, the two possibilities you have, and you add them together in this linear combination, take the P image and then double the S image and add it to the P image, the result is approximately uh, how much fluorophore there is in the different locations in the, in the image. You do this at every pixel in the image. Uh, and what you see is independent of orientation. This is a combination that uh, is independent of orientation, but it is proportional to the total amount of fluorophore there and, uh, of course, the intensity of the illumination. But the key thing is to look at the ratio of the image excited by P-polarized light to the uh, image excited by S-polarized light. You take the ratio, that ratio depends only on orientation. Um, it does not depend on how much of the fluorophore was there uh, or the illumination intensity. So, uh, and it doesn't depend on how far the fluorophores are from the surface. That P over S is entirely orientation. So you can get basically an image or a reconstructed image of orientation of membrane or other organelles that you might be looking at uh, just by taking the P over S ratio of uh, polarized turf illumination. And it works. Um, if you have a red blood cell here, for example, labeled with dye I, this is the S polarized, this is the P polarized image. You take the ratio, the places that you see that look bright are the edges where the membrane is not parallel to the surface, but in fact it's uh, oriented uh, with a component perpendicular to the surface. This lower series uh, is a macrophage labeled with dye I, and uh, the P polar, the S polarized, the P polarized. Uh, if you take the ratio, the places that uh, turn out bright are um, endocytotic sites. That's the job of a macrophage is to eat things and has a lot of um, indentations on its surface. Uh, they show up uh, independently of the local concentration of the fluorophore. It's just a map of orientations. And uh, this, uh, this can be done also not just with two polarizations, but you might want to introduce a third color so you can see some other process going on in the cell at the same time. Like, uh, for example, uh, there might be an indentation in the surface uh, right where a, an exocytotic event is taking place. You can use the other color illumination to track that and uh, then uh, uh, watch how the membrane changes during uh, a secretion event. So for example, this is uh, um, uh, granules, secretory granules, excited with, uh, with one color um, uh, in the blue, and you, uh, where the granule is, you see a granule, and then in the next frame, all of a sudden it's gone. That was an exocytotic event, uh, and it, it's gone. Uh, if you look uh, in this double-labeled sample uh, at the P over S ratio to look at orientations, uh, there's not too much distinguishable going on there, but uh, after the, or shortly after the secretion event, you often see a, an indentation. Uh, a higher P over S ratio, and in fact that indentation lasts for quite a long time, for uh, it could be uh, for minutes even. Uh, and uh, by doing this you can see where and when the secretion event happens and then what happens to the orientation of the plasma membrane during that event. So in conclusion uh, about the polarized uh, turf business, uh, you can detect a possible 
local regions of altered fluorophore orientation. Even if these regions are submicroscopic, uh, you know, you couldn't actually resolve them, you'll still see a point of light in the P over S ratio. Uh, you can look at fast processes in cells, uh, and you might not be able to see these processes by any other uh, optical technique. And to summarize the whole uh, view of TURF, um, you can use TURF to look at uh, small random motions of organelles toward or away from the membrane. I didn't talk about that uh, much, but if an organelle is fluorescent labeled and it moves further away, it gets dimmer. If it gets closer, it gets brighter, and you can actually quantitatively recover how rapidly it moves in the Z direction, even uh, down on to the scale of, of um, 10 nanometers. Uh, you can look at submembrane events, like I talked about. Uh, um, uh, you can look at the membrane folding and indentations. You can also measure by combining this with various other techniques. Uh, if you have a fluorophore on the surface, how long does it stay on the surface before it comes off? Or how, how long does it take for a new fluorophore to show up? Uh, you can combine it with, with photobleaching, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching, or fluorescence correlation spectroscopy to get those kinetic rates. Uh, it's also useful, as I mentioned, for single molecule fluorescence because of the low background and, uh, and for looking uh, at the surface diffusion, a molecule moving around on the surface. So uh, uh, for this uh, talk, I wanted to thank um, Ron Holtz, my collaborator at the University of Michigan, who uh, is a specialist in uh, cellular secretion and uh, uh, former graduate students and postdocs of ours, uh, Susan Sand, Miriam Malersma, Alexa Mathesis, uh, and Arun uh, Anantharam. And Joel Swanson is a professor at Michigan in microbiology. Thanks. <laughs>